SpaceX, Starbase, Cape Canaveral. You've got questions, we've got the answers. Thanks for tuning in to episode 79 of Lab Padre's Weekly Updates. Now let's dig in. Beginning at the build site, the truss section that connects the walls above the doorway of the new mega bay was lifted into place on Friday morning. Looking toward the ring yard, Booster 13's common dome section could be seen positioned outside the first mega bay. On Saturday, the first of two frame sections for the final corner of the new mega bay was lifted into place. Over at the launch site, the chopsticks were opened on Monday afternoon, a few hours ahead of the Starship 25 rollout. A pair of self-propelled modular transporters headed down Highway 4 before taking the sharp turn into Sanchez, making their way to the Rocket Garden for Ship 25's rollout. With a few more hours of preparation, Ship 25 began a somewhat protracted stop-and-go journey to the launch site. After fixing some malfunctions with the transporters, Ship 25 arrived at the pad in the pre-dawn hours of Tuesday morning. Once the ship was between the chopsticks, the lifting arms were closed and preparations began to attach to the anchoring hardpoints under the forward flaps. After the pins were in place, Ship 25 began its slow lift onto the booster. The lift seemed to go well, and after taking some time to verify the alignment, Starship broke its own record for the tallest launch vehicle ever made. Let's take a closer look at the vehicle. The ship tiles are a bit rough, and many of them appear to have been epoxied for repairs, since the ship is not expected to survive re-entry. We also got our first view of the hardened dance floor underneath the ship, which has been modified to better protect the engines during ignition. Starship 25 has not had its flight termination system armed yet, so we can expect to see one more D-stack ahead of flight. Back at the build site, Booster 13's common dome section was moved into the mega bay. A liquid oxygen tank section for Booster 13 was also brought to the mega bay, signaling the start of a booster assembly. Once everything was connected to the mega bay crane, Booster 13's common dome was stacked on the LOX tank section. Returning to the launch site, the ship quick disconnect arm, which has been raised six feet for the hot staging ring, was attached to Starship 26. The ship quick disconnect performed full speed retaction tests just 40 minutes later as crews wasted no time making sure the various changes are good to go. A mechanically actuated protective cover for the ship's propellant, power, and data interface, a new addition since IFT-1, was also checked out. The mechanism seemed to work as expected, and after a bit of realignment, the arm was reconnected to the ship. Wednesday morning saw the ship load spreader relocated to the launch site in preparation for Ship 26's upcoming campaign at the launch site's test stand. Later in the day, in contrast to the beautiful beach at Boca Chica, and with the largest rocket ever built in the background, crews continued work on the concrete wall near test stands A and B. Over at the build site, the first of the new mega bays, two roofs spanning truss sections, which have been under assembly for the past few weeks, was lifted to the top of the building. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how big the mega bays, boosters, and starships actually are, until you see workers on a beam or a man basket hanging from a crane to add perspective. Part of the water tank distribution manifold was cut out and removed from the flame deflector farm, leaving the system out of commission for at least several days. On Thursday, Ship 31's forward dome section, which forms the top of the ship's methane fuel tank, was moved into the high bay. As the day rolled on, the nose cone originally intended to be for Ship 21, then repurposed as an HLS test article, was seen receiving a fresh coat of white paint on the exposed stainless steel. Although TPS tiles were applied to the nose cone early on, HLS starships will not need them since they are only being designed for moon landings. After spending several weeks in the rocket garden, the flapless and tireless Starship 26 was brought to the launch site for its static fire test campaign. This vehicle is believed to be manifested for the third flight of Starship and is expected to perform propellant transfer development testing while in orbit. 
Without flaps or tiles to damage, SpaceX may elect to leave the ship on site during the second integrated flight test. Before arriving at the launch site, Ship 26, just like every other Starship and Super Heavy booster before it, must pass by Hoppy, which now serves as a water tank, observation platform, PA system, weather station, and has worn many hats in its time at the launch site. Completing its journey down Highway 4, Ship 26 was brought over to the test stands ahead of its lift and placement by SpaceX's LR-11000. While Ship 26 awaited its lift, the mix water and nitrogen detonation suppression systems under the orbital launch mount were tested. Returning to the build site, the second of two large roof trusses was lifted to the top of the bay. Most of the building's primary load-bearing elements are now in place. The orbital launch tower's chopsticks were opened and raised to their launch configuration before returning to the ship holding position a few minutes later. A new three-tank manifold was delivered to the launch site. This revised component will replace the parts which were removed earlier. This week at the Cape saw Signet Titan towing Just Read the Instructions to Sea very early on Friday morning to support the launch of Starlink Group 6-12. On Saturday, a tandem lift by the dockside cranes saw Falcon 9 Booster 1080 laid onto the horizontal transporter for refurbishment at Roberts Road. SpaceX support ship Megan headed to sea in the afternoon for splashdown and recovery operations ahead of Crew 6's imminent return to Earth after a six-month stay at the International Space Station. The Tug Crosby Skipper returned to port on Sunday with a short fall of Gravitas and Booster 1077, which successfully lofted Starlink Group 6-13 into space on the 31st. Late that night, Falcon 9 Booster 1073 took off in its 10th flight, launching Starlink Group 6-12 for SpaceX's ever-growing satellite internet constellation. Booster 1077 was lifted onto the dockside stands on Tuesday, freeing up a short fall of Gravitas for its next mission as SpaceX continues to push for 100 launches this year. Crosby Skipper headed to sea, towing a short fall of Gravitas just a few hours later for the Starlink Group 6-14 mission. Doug rounded out the evening with a return to port with two sets of fairing halves, bringing them back from the Starlink Group 6-12 and 6-13 launches. After offloading the Crew-6 capsule at Trident Basin, SpaceX recovery ship Megan returned to its moorings at Port Canaveral on Wednesday. The first segment of the new Space Launch Complex 40 Crew Access Tower was brought to the launch site. With crew launch capabilities at both pads, a damaging explosion from Falcon or Starship will not interrupt flights to the space station. Special thanks to Space Flight Now for this footage. Signet Titan made its return to port with Just Read the Instructions and Falcon 9 Booster 1073 from Starlink Group 6-12 on Thursday. Falcon 9 Booster 1077 wrapped up its stay at Port Canaveral docks by being laid on the horizontal transporter before heading to Roberts Road. Late in the evening, support ship Shannon returned to port from the alternate contingency Crew 6 splashdown location on the west coast of Florida. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. We'll see you next week, and thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.